So my name is John Weber. I'm the VP of sales for new use energy. I have been um, in the renewable energy industry with a few different manufacturers as well as reseller distributors and seen quite a few um, things over the last decade, in particular, this transition that we're seeing uh, in the last three to five years uh, towards lithium. And we do get a lot of questions at new use energy about uh, use of lithium. And of course, with the other companies that I worked with, I still have friends in the industry who are asking me questions about how do I get, uh, how do I take my system or my solution from an AGM or flooded lead acid battery over to a lithium? What do I need to know? What sort of things do I need to be looking for? Hopefully we'll be able to address most of those questions uh, during today's presentation and give you some guidance on best practices as well. Uh, New Use Energy is a young company. We've been around for four years, but we have a lot of veterans in the industry with well over 50 years worth of a combined experience uh, from installers to international salespeople uh, who are helping us develop um, systems over in Europe. And we're very, very strong supporter of um, providing power and resiliency into Ukraine uh, during the battles there um, from hospitals of forward operating bases. So we, uh, the equipment that we talk about and that we have and that we use is tested in some of the harshest environments in the world. And we're proud to say that it's lasting. So it's a, it's a fun place to work and I really enjoy uh, what we're doing there. Some of the things that we'll be covering today is just some common terms. I want to make sure that, you know, SOC and DOD and um, days of autonomy and different words like that are familiar. We'll do a brief history of both lead as well as lithium. And then we'll talk a bit about uh, lithium from new use energy and then dive into some of the, the potatoes and meat side of things or the meat and potato side of things uh, with what to consider within the battery with battery management, different cell types. Um, also best practices. One of the best ways to damage your system, it doesn't matter if it's AGM or lithium, is maybe not using the correct conductors or using the best practices when landing your conductors on those batteries. So we'll spend a little bit of time there. Uh, I've seen too many systems murdered over the years uh, with accidentally doing it incorrectly or not taking the time to program the unit from the beginning to actually meet charge parameters. Um, and then uh, finally, we'll finish out just sort of a balance between when do I choose an AGM battery and when do I choose uh, a lithium product? And then we'll open it up for some questions. So the basic battery terminology uh, that you know anybody's gonna ask if you're doing a sizing practice is days of autonomy. Meaning if I don't have solar, if I don't have a charging source, how long does that energy need to last? Oftentimes people say just one day because I want to have solar be part of that story. I want to have a backup gener generator be added and I want part of that story. So days of autonomy just simply means days of the battery run with loads and without charging. A cycle, of course, is one charge and discharge. Typically people ask like, well, what if I only take 2% out? When does a, a cycle actually happen? And Typically, we say about 10% depth of discharge, which if we look down below, that means total capacity removed. So if we take 10% out of the battery, that leaves us with a 90% state of charge. And that uh, is typically what we would call a cycle is a minimum of 10% dip depth of discharge. Otherwise, that falls into something we call microcycling. Uh, and that can happen if you are in, say, somewhere like California, you have a grid tie system and the solar is not keeping up, but you have a large battery system and you're trying to offset um, your consumption with battery and solar. Uh, very quickly, as we look at SOC versus DOD, state of charge, this is sort of, I should have an analogy of, you know, a glass half full or half empty. State of charge is the glass half full, meaning that we are describing how much is remaining inside of the battery. Whereas depth of discharge is a glass half empty, meaning we're taking something out of it and we're trying to determine it. And of course the secret is at 50%, that is the exact same number. So a quick quiz for yourself, at what percentage is SOC and DOD the same? At 50%. Otherwise they are describing completely opposite things and uh, know your terms because when I listen to somebody and they they switch these terms around by accident, it tells me that they aren't super familiar with the products that they're working with. So uh, familiarize yourself so you sound awesome when you're talking to whomever. Evolution of the lead acid battery. Of course, this goes back all the way to the 1800s. Um, if you remember your science classes, uh, Volta, 
made the vault to stack and was able to get frog's legs to start twitching around and um, basically made the first uh, voltaic pile. Uh, about 60 years later was the first really practical rechargeable flooded lead acid battery. And ultimately when somebody asks me, what's the best bang for the buck? Uh, it is actually an FLA battery, but it requires tremendous amount of maintenance. And we'll go into a little bit of that later on. Something that got rid of that heavy maintenance, of course, is moving on to AGM, which is absorbed glass mat batteries. Basically this is a sealed battery that doesn't require uh, any maintenance uh, or any added water or things like that. Um, and we've seen technology leaps over the last uh, couple of decades where they've started adding um, extra components to the lead paste or the lead plates uh, to increase the surface area by using something like carbon. Uh, and this actually allows the battery to be used more evenly and the plates to wear more evenly uh, than they have before. The ultimate question to answer is, uh, you know, when we look on the inside of the, the plates themselves, is you can notice this gap here down at the bottom. On all lead acid batteries, there's always a gap down here. Why? Uh, because as we use the battery, the plates slowly dissolve over time in 10 years or one year if you accidentally abuse your battery, and that material sloughs off. If it's sloughing off faster than the plates are naturally being absorbed because of damage, that pile can build up and actually short the insides of um, the battery. So something to be mindful of. So since the 1800s, lead acid batteries have been using the same basic principles, which is essentially two dissimilar metals inside of a big bucket of electrolyte. In this case, for most lead acid batteries, that is an acid, uh, sulfuric acid. And it, sulfuric acid is actually part of the chemical process where we're depositing the sulfur onto the plates and then removing it when we use electro electrolysis to then separate it back into there. So if you're familiar with lead acid batteries and you're familiar with flooded lead acid batteries, there's something called a hydrometer and they can literally tell how much material is dissolved inside that liquid to tell you exactly what the state of charge is. The downside of modern batteries, while they don't require watering, they do require the necessity of guessing what's inside because you can no longer take a physical reading of the internal of the battery AGM batteries or gel batteries, sealed batteries, you have to use a load tester to actually understand how much power is inside of there. And so what we have here is we essentially have at the top, we have our positive and negative and our fill cap. They've come a long ways with fill caps. They actually have a recovery system in most of them these days. So your watering requirements are lower. And uh, we essentially are separating the plates out between positive and negative and we build up to the voltage that's required. So this essentially is a two volt cell. So if we take two, four, six, eight, 10, here we have a 12 volt battery. So when you see a traditional 12 volt battery or you see a two volt battery, a two volt battery just simply represents one cell. Um, and if you look around, especially in the flooded lead acid uh, range, you can find a variety of styles uh, from two volt, four volt, six volt, eight volt, 12, and then typically you start bringing the batteries externally together through busing to create a higher um, voltage than 12. Are there exceptions to that rule? Absolutely. Um, but for the most part, the 12 volt reigns uh, when it comes to flooded lead acid batteries or AGM batteries. On the lithium ion side, we have our first rechargeable uh, by Dr. Whittingham, uh, did research around lithium and throughout the 80s and really into the beginning of the 90s was when we saw that first rechargeable lithium ion battery. The instabilities of the 80s didn't really help out with the battery and there was quite a few uh, exciting moments during the early development. And that was one of the things that, you know, modern technology and chemistries within lithium are actually addressing is the stability of the internals rather than the um, number of electrons we can move. So. Um, especially in the last uh, decade or so, we've seen very stable products come out, uh, in particular products like uh, lithium iron phosphate has become sort of the gold standard here in North America as a recognized safe battery. And uh, in part, that's because of the technology that's being wrapped up inside of the batteries themselves. There are other technologies that are out there, and there are actually even other packages out there of product, oops, um, that we can talk about as well. And we'll get to it in just a second. 
inside each one of these batteries are typically just three different types of um, cell. And we have the pouch cell, and typically these are found in, in laptops, um, computers, and things like that, where size and density is very, very important. So it's literally just foil holding it all itself together uh, inside of there. You know, I, I do RC airplanes and RC cars and drones. You'll typically, if you open up those packages or you're, you're just ordering to build your own um, kits, these small packets are very, very lightweight, very high energy density. But if you abuse them, they start to puff up uh, and they just don't have the same survivability uh, when it comes to usage. So you're trading off survivability uh, for lightweight. On the cylindrical, these are very common uh, when we look around at something like Makita's all the way up to the Tesla car actually has um, large uh, cells inside of there. And most of the big cases that you'll see, like the one that you saw in the previous photo of the new use energy uh, five kilowatt hour battery are using prismatics. Uh, this just makes putting the cells in there very, very easy. What I like about the prismatic is that it is highly customizable, meaning that they can build that pouch or pack. I shouldn't use pouch. The prismatic pack uh, can be designed to just about any shape that you would like. And that's also a benefit of the pouch. Cyndrical has excellent thermal capabilities uh, because of the surface area that's involved with them. Um, it makes them a little bit easier to manage in high thermal cycling uh, applications, which is a likely reason why we see it in, in so many vehicles is because it's a easily calculated and known quantity. So when you think about what engineers are doing, uh, designing batteries for cars and all the different temperature ranges that they have to work with those cars in, using the cylindrical cell is a, uh, an easy way to do that because the modeling software makes that a little bit easier as well. There are a tremendous number of different choices out there. NMC is probably one of the most common that we had um, back in about 2010. And we've seen that transition over to actually um, iron phosphate or lithium iron phosphate. When it comes down to choosing what the best product is, you can see here that there are some give and takes depending on your application. If you're gonna be putting, let's say a new use energy battery uh, into a mobile application, Having high energy density is excellent. Of course, there are some other products out there that are even higher density, but then you have to take off uh, or take into account some of your power density as well as your calendar life and just relative cost. Some of these products actually carry a very, very different price point um, when you compare them uh, side by side. So uh, lithium titanate is a very powerful chemistry, but also comes with a very powerful uh, cost. Uh, to implement. And I think that there's a lot of work being done here as well with solid state lithium and, and a few other chemistries. There are a lot of resources out there. I would suggest if you really want to dig into it, um, I would welcome it and, and encourage you to. But as a general rule, again, iron phosphate has been the product that is most accepted as the, the product for residential and uh, commercial applications. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, a Wi-Fi repeater site that's being powered with a, a lithium ion battery, uh, or if it's a full residential system in Washington state or you know any state that's a, a grid tie system uh, that's doing self-consumption and, and cycling uh, regularly, lithium iron phosphate really has become sort of the gold standard in the expectation of the customer base. What do we need to know about the, the modern technology. The, the cycle lives have continued to improve. We're starting to see products that are going to outlast a lot of the rest of the system that you may be implementing it into. Um, but we also need to recognize that this is a very high energy dense product and we can discharge those batteries to an exceptionally low amount. And one of the things that I've learned over the years uh, when working with other companies is the number one killer of batteries is making mistakes. And so we call that murdering your batteries. And, uh, and the reason I say that is, is that a lot of times people don't realize that lead acid batteries, when you discharge them below 50%, or they aren't aware that they're doing it, or they might know it, but they aren't aware of that they're doing it. Um, if the system isn't programmed to help prevent that, most systems will happily discharge like a lead acid battery down to zero and the system goes dark. 
And unfortunately, during that time, we're also damaging those plates that I described earlier inside the batteries uh, for lead acid. And they are slowly being dissolved, even in a discharge state, and you're not using the battery. So Cyclife really depends on DOD. With lithium ion, there is a little bit of that to take into account, but the number of cycles is um, not going to, it shouldn't really change your decision making uh, when you're talking about depth of discharge. The internal battery management system will help you manage that system, uh, ensure that you don't accidentally discharge it. Of course, with it being a smaller footprint and lighter weight, that means that you can potentially add more storage to the same location. So if you are pulling out old flooded lead acid or old AGM batteries, you may be surprised that while it fits the same number of amp hours in space, because you can go to that low depth of discharge on it, in, you could argue that you're actually doubling your available storage because that recommendation of not discharging AGM batteries below 50% that same footprint, same batteries, you now have a full 100% depth of discharge um, and it makes it very, very easy. One of the great things as well is, is that there is a variety of lithium ion products out there for new use and just within the market itself uh, with different sizes and shapes. So if you're looking for an L16 style shape or an 8D like you see here on the screen, there are a lot of different um, batteries that can fulfill your needs all the way down to little uh, lithium ion 12 volt batteries. What I do like about these products is because they are much more murder proof, that internal battery management system is managing that unit uh, and ensuring that we don't over discharge or overcharge the batteries. Those warranties are getting longer and longer. And that means that uh, you can sort of know that it's just going to work. Whereas lead acid, I think there's always been a little bit of a mystery around that product and uh, people have actually struggled very much with getting that system um, dialed in. I've met a few people who've gotten 20 years out of their flooded lead acid batteries because they had a very meticulous approach to the battery. Most people treat their batteries like a hot water tank heater. They plug it in, they check to make sure it makes hot water and then they use it every single day. And then one day it springs a leak because uh, they didn't do the maintenance on the hot water tank that could have been done. Um, and so that's the same sort of idea. The lithium ion batteries make it so that that maintenance does not, or that requirement of maintenance is much lower and reduces the amount of time um, that you're spending each quarter, every year, uh, rather than every month checking those batteries. Today's lithium ion, we're seeing the prices precipitously drop. If you're from the solar industry, like myself, uh, it's following the, the panel price it dropped. When I first got in in 2012, uh, we saw that the batteries were um, pretty level, but panel prices were at $2.50 a watt, $2.75 a watt. And now if you look around for a good deal, you can probably find them for 25 cents a watt. Now, I don't know that we're going to see battery prices come down that much, but we should continue to expect um, as infrastructure gets built up uh, more and more lithium ion on the market that's reasonably priced. And that's something that I love about the new use product is, is we are actually already at the price point where we're very competitive with a high quality set of AGM batteries. And because of that uh, improved warranty and the bankability of it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of the things to note when you are thinking about choosing lithium ion is it does require a little bit more in the shipping cost when making that choice. Why? Because the lithium is actually considered a hazardous material. So you want to make sure that you have a UN 38.3 um, shipper who understands how to put the labeling and things like that. Fortunately, New Use Energy does and can get those products moving. Um, but just make sure that you understand what your requirements are for getting the battery delivered to your location. Again, because of that internal protection within the BMS and, and monitoring, there's a lot of advantages uh, that we'll go into in a little bit later about how to use this product. Um, one other thing to note about lithium ion, of course, is that it has a very narrow, narrow voltage window when we compare it to a traditional lead acid battery. Traditional lead acid battery can go from let's say 46 volts or sometimes even lower than that, all the way up to 57, 58. Uh, if it's a flooded lead acid battery, you could have a system that was programmed to charge it up to 60 volts. So when you are considering putting a lithium ion product into your home, absolutely make sure that you understand what your 
um, settings are because you don't want to leave it programmed for AGM or flooded. You definitely need to make sure that you can actually make those changes to the product uh, to correctly program it up. So check the spec sheets, make sure that you understand um, with legacy inverters especially um, that you can program it. There are some less expensive products out there that unfortunately uh, they just, they got a switch and it's, you choose between uh, flooded and AGM or flooded and sealed. And that's the little switch on there. Uh, if you are considering an AGM battery for that type of inverter, I would not recommend it. I would actually recommend considering changing out that inverter to a more modern product. Again, because uh, you're gonna run into issues with the internal BMS to the battery protecting itself, but that would be a big hassle to you because every time you go to charge your batteries during the daytime, they would kick out to self-protect if you were to charge them up to, let's say, a flooded lead acid uh, bat target battery voltage. So these are our um, products from New Use Energy. We provide a, a variety of them. This is just a, a small sampling. I, I could have made my own entire presentation just uh, talking about New Use batteries and where you could put them. But I wanted to make sure that we uh, gave you some broad brushstroke information. Of course, you could reach out to us afterwards. With this 8D battery here, and then we have our metal case battery for the golf cart industry, other than can go into just about any application that you would like, it really just sort of comes down to what you're looking to do with the battery itself. Um, because it is a, a simple open loop communication battery, it's not requiring communications like some of the other sort of residential 9540AB um, systems. It's a very easy system to get going. It just replaces the battery. Because it's a sturdy ABS fire retardant case uh, or a metal case, this is going to um, protect the battery from getting a little too excited if it's in a fiery environment. And I'm not worried about the fire on the inside, it's sometimes the fire on the outside that gets to it. And this will buy the, um, your home as well as the firefighters more time because we do have a fire retardant case and of course the metal case here. If you are doing a lithium ion replacement uh, into an AGM system, these are pretty easy to drop in. You know, typically, as we had mentioned earlier, lead acid batteries, 12 volts is king. So if you have a 48 volt system, then you would need to have a few more parallel connections. So one thing to make sure that you're cognizant of is that when you transition over to a lithium ion battery, that's already 48 volts or already 24 volts, uh, you are going to need some extra conductors and potentially a bus bar. And we'll touch on uh, how to bus up uh, equipment here uh, towards the end of the presentation. One of the nice things is, is that uh, we're not really limited uh, on a reasonably small or reasonably medium to small system with up to 20 in parallel. And this is this example here, of course, is a five kilowatt hour battery. And both of these are essentially five kilowatt hours. And so that's going to be a tremendous amount of power. If you need more than that, um, let us know. We, we'd be happy to help you out. The other is, is that it's a one person lift. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to lift an old 8D lead acid battery out of a cabinet, um, but if you're bent over too far, it's almost a two man lift uh, from the beginning. Uh, this battery and this battery weigh roughly around 70 to 72 pounds. Uh, this one has handles to get it in and out. Um, and this has um, an easy way to get it out as well. We've got some handles on the sides for some of those batteries. So it can be a one person lift and we do actually offer it in a heated application. So if you're up in the, the, the region that gets 105 all the way down to minus uh, 20 degrees, uh, we can actually help out with a, a cold weather application. One of my favorite things about this product, and we'll spend a bit more time on the next slide with it, is that BMS communications, both internal and external. If you look here very carefully on our golf cart batteries, it's just the name we use here uh, at New Use, it could be used for anything really, is an external display that goes into this RS-485 port right here. And then the battery monitoring uh, clips onto here and gets you a complete system. So as for applications, really these batteries and what's being offered from New Use um, can replace just about any battery that you can think of. Um, maybe the one that I would say avoid a little bit would be a car starter battery. Um, I don't know that lithium necessarily should be exposed to under the engine hood heat. Uh, you know, I, I ride a lot of motorcycles and the, the battery is separated uh, distinctly from the, the rest of the bike. But when you think about an automotive situation, you have a tremendous amount of heat under the cabin or, you know, under the, 
um, the hood. And so I don't know that, that that would be one exception, but if you're looking to move an electric vehicle, vehicle or get over into the off-grid world um, or telecommunications, tiny homes, uh, all of these products are a great match to being able to do that. And if it's exceptionally cold, we can uh, provide a heated battery as well. When you're thinking about like, what goes into my battery, what should I choose? Um, what is that difference when I'm taking it from AGM? As I mentioned earlier, the AGM batteries, you just don't know what's going on inside. Yeah, you can add a shunt. Yeah, you can do a load test, but how are the plates doing? What is the, um, what is the quality of the product inside? Meaning how much life do I have left? Uh, it leaves a big mystery. And this is one of the things that I like about the lithium ion products. And this one in particular um, from new use, this is a 50 amp hour, 48 volt battery. Um, is every one of the batteries has an, an internal Bluetooth. So you can see it on the phone. And if you get the metal cased uh, batteries, like you see here uh, with that little display, you get the same information right there on a display. So if you're like, gosh, I'd really love to have that. How do I tie it together, John? I just want one display with one everything. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, the displays are actually fairly inexpensive uh, and it allows you to see each individual battery as you go. So if you're traditionally, if you're changing out a traditional lead acid battery and dropping in lithium, being able to have those screens and, and labeled out as individual displays isn't, uh, isn't a bad idea at all. Actually, I, I would endorse it, um, but you can also actually see all of those batteries uh, with a simple Bluetooth app. Uh, that can be downloaded uh, and literally that QR code you see there in the center of the screen uh, is how you'd get to it. And the thing about this is, this is what's gonna take out the, and I'm gonna jump down to the next slide very quickly just so you can see what else is inside of it and we'll jump back again. But you're not only seeing what the total in and out is based on how much load there is, you can actually see how much time is remaining and we can actually dive into and see how healthy each individual cell is. And if the system's having a hard time, uh, it's going to actually call out with color coding, which voltage uh, is a bit different than the others. And you can see over the lifetime of the battery. So we've got a, another one here. Uh, they're drawing out uh, about 60 amps out of this thing. And we've got about an hour and 48 minutes left on there. This is the same slide. And so uh, you can also see the number of cycles that you've done. Not quite sure exactly when the state of charge uh, creates a cycle mark, but we definitely get that information if you're super curious on it. But we'll be able to, you'll be able to see exactly when you're using the battery, how much time is left, and what a great way to understand how you're using the system. One of the other things to note when you're choosing your storage device is open loop versus closed loop communication. There are several different manufacturers out there. Uh, as an example, somebody like Solark, they have open or closed loop communications. The closed loop communications means that the inverter is talking directly to the battery through a communications wire. And that's gonna get you just slightly better performance on average about five to 10% is what's been described to me from several different manufacturers um, that are out there they're very um, bullish on trying to get that better performance and, and that makes sense. But you're also paying a bit of a premium to ensure that that communication has been established and everything else. Uh, for open loop communications and legacy products that didn't have it, if we're talking about um, an old golf cart uh, or if we're talking about, you know, on the renewable energy side, an old uh, Schneider Electric, an old Outback, an old Magnum, um, an old Ames inverter. There's a bunch of different inverters that are out there. You're going to want to use that open loop communication. And what's very important about open loop communication is making sure that you're programming that system accurately. So not too much more time needs to be sent here. The other question we need to talk about and ask is, is will it turn over what I'm trying to do? If you are providing a direct DC supply to the system, Make sure that you actually have looked at the spec sheet. This is the spec sheet for our battery, um, just for convenience, of course. Uh, you can see that we've got a max current of 100 amps, and we also have a 600 amp surge. What does that mean? If you are considering dropping this battery into a golf cart, will it get me up that hill from a stop? And having this peak discharge current for three to five seconds, um, we've been able to prove out uh, with several of our uh, golf customers that even in a six person golf cart, fully loaded down with people going up a hill just as an experiment, 
that it was in fact able to move that battery and that battery wasn't actually even at 100%. One of the benefits of lithium over lithium, uh, sorry, lithium over AGM, of course, is the nominal voltage is slightly higher and it tends to hold that voltage much better than uh, lead acid. When lead acid gets under a heavy load, you can see a precipitous uh, drop in voltage. And that, of course, causes current to drive up. And so you're fighting against yourself. One of my favorite things about lithium, actually, is, is that it does have that narrow voltage window, which means that you're not getting that sag at the end. It's, oh, it's slowing down. I, you know, we couldn't make it back up to the hill or we couldn't um, drive whatever we were trying to use for, let's call it a satellite communication because uh, a lead acid battery fell below the 48 volts and the communications turned off because it can't go below 48. So one of the great things about lithium ion is that it does a really good job of holding at voltage. The downside is there's very little warning very towards the end that the lithium ion battery is actually about done. And that's why being able to see inside the BMS and things like that is critically important uh, in understanding what's going on with your battery. Cause you don't want to be at, I was at 50 volts with 15% state of charge left in the battery. And I did a thing and then I got stuck. Why? Because I didn't look and I didn't understand that I, the low that I was going to run, um, was going to basically consume all the battery power inside of there. Whereas a traditional AGM probably would have given you a more physical warning, if you will, as that voltage starts to collapse at the end of the battery life, you know, you're down at 48, 47, 46, falling to 42 volts. It's a very easy way to kind of know where you're at on voltage. So that's why being able to see inside the battery is critically important uh, when you're looking at lithium. Something that's also critically important is making sure that we stay safe with our batteries. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a system being poorly treated uh, because they didn't do it right. Uh, here's some examples that we have. Here's some flooded lead acid batteries sitting right over the top of some power electronics equipment from Outback. And what's happening is, is that these are flooded lead acid batteries that are discharging sulfur. It smells when it's charging, it smells a bit like rotten eggs. And what causes damage to the power electronics is those whiffs of sulfur make their way up inside of the unit and uh, unfortunately can damage it. So while this is a very nice clean install, the distance or the safety distance between the batteries and the power electronics was not taken into account. We always suggest separating the equipment in a safe way so that if something happens up here, we've seen lightning strikes get very exciting with power electronics. And if you were right on top of each other, there is a chance that you could actually cause harm to the battery. Having them separated, making sure that you're venting your system is critically important. Just as critical as making sure that it is a clean install, it looks great up here, but then they got all crazy with their bus bars. And bus bars is a, another part that I wanna spend just a moment talking about. We wanna transition from that to something like this. Now, this is a very, very large system. It had a, almost a megawatt hour of sealed batteries, but the busing is so important. And when we look at busing, we talk about busing within the AGM uh, or lead acid transition is that you very likely will need to bring in a small bus bar. Why? Because we're no longer taking four batteries and making 48 volts from 12 to 48. That's four batteries and they're interconnected. Instead, we're using that same space to drop in 48 volt batteries. So instead of creating what we call a series connection, like a string of pearls, we're connecting everything together, we're going with a parallel connection. So a few more conductors are going to be required when you're installing it um, to make sure that you're doing it right and that you have enough surface area and room so that you don't end up with something uh, like this. Uh, I'm sure it's just fine, but the first time somebody has to troubleshoot a conductor that's coming from up here to down here from a, a battery, um, even good labeling, this is, this is difficult. And the chances of having a short are actually quite high um, because I believe that we have both the positive and the negative conductors right next to each other with just a small space. So please, please, please be mindful of that. There are a lot of companies out there that are actually providing um, different bus bar kits with standoffs and whatnot. So I'd encourage you guys to, to take a look. So if you are considering bringing in a lithium ion product and getting that busing, um, check out the different uh, companies out there. I believe this is Storm Copper 
Uh, I've worked with them on a handful of times and they've actually been great to work with. They didn't pay me for this endorsement. Uh, they've just been really great to work with in the past. They also have a lot of resources for sizing uh, and understanding what ampacity as well as the number, uh, the, essentially the surface area and the thickness of the conductor uh, is all labeled out. So they do have a lot of resources. If you're trying to figure that out, um, you can call them, they'll answer your questions or you can use their online resources. One of the other parts that we want to make sure that we're covering uh, when we talk about lithium ion uh, is making sure that the conductors are properly done, that we have the right uh, amperage and we were using the right um, conductor. If you recall back, our nominal is 100 amps coming out of that system, but we can surge for 600 amps for three to five seconds. So depending on your application, you may need to take into account the, the amount of current that's coming from the inrush or surge. Um, as well as just sort of the, the human condition, meaning that uh, people start out with one thing and then they tend to get bigger and bigger. You know, in North America, somebody says, oh, it's a tiny home. And then they decide after the first six months that the tiny home needs an AC unit because it's just too hot in the summer. So the human condition just simply means people tend to add more loads, more convenience to their lives. Um, and so you need to take that into account when you're sizing. I typically say go one size larger than you think you're going to need because you may need to go one size larger in life. Uh, as well, uh, we want to make sure that we're using ring terminals and compression fittings uh, and connecting that system up. If you're ever interested in learning more about that safety, I've got a whole deck uh, just describing uh, safety when working with power electronics as well as um, lithium ion and lead acid. Choosing your technology. At the end of the day, and I know that I didn't give like the specific answer, but John, what's better? What's going to work all the time in every situation for me? Unfortunately, that is not the case. Lithium and lead acid definitely have their own place. I would say that the pendulum has swung, especially since probably 2019, 2018, I think was sort of the last grand years of uh, lead acid. And I would say that it was probably 90% lead acid. And then we had some early adopters and people kind of building their own battery banks and whatnot, um, you know, since 2015. But then we saw a lot of lithium ion companies come onto the scene, including New Use and many, many others. The end result is, is that we've seen it switch. We've seen it move from lead acid to lithium and people are asking for lithium more and more often. Uh, talking to lead acid people, I just helped somebody troubleshoot one of their systems. The system was less than a year old and they had accidentally not set up the system correctly and they unfortunately destroyed or murdered their lead acid battery. The lead acid batteries, of course, do the best in very, very cold temperatures. On average, they're a little bit cheaper. Um, the upside of lead acid uh, over lithium is they actually are very recyclable. There's about 90% of the materials that are involved in it, the lead, the lead paste, um, even the sulfuric acid um, is all reused uh, and recovered inside those batteries. It does a great job of, um, of being environmentally friendly. Lithium, there are more and more recycled companies out there, but typically they're incinerating them, but there is some new technologies coming out that are taking... Um, lithium iron phosphates and finding ways of separating out the materials again off of the um, how it's manufactured. If you've never seen how a lithium ion battery is manufactured, do a quick uh, Google video search. It's fascinating uh, to see how they put the paste on and then roll them up. One of the downsides when we compare lithium to lead acid on the lead acid side is they have a high self discharge rate. Most of the time, if you were to talk to a manufacturer or a distributor for lead acid batteries, there is a maintenance cycle. And if you look at actually how they construct their batteries and the boxes that they put them in, they ensure that they're easily had, meaning they can open them up very easily and add a, a freshening charge to those batteries. Lithium ion has a very low self discharge rate um, less than 1% per month. So part of it is, is about how are you using that battery and ultimately kind of paying the piper uh, with lead acid because you do have to have that higher um, charge per cycle. You have to put more electrons into the battery to complete the charge to ensure that it's uh, you're completing that chemical process inside of the, the lead acid. Whereas lithium, it's a bit of a different chemistry. And so you just don't need to have those long absorb times 
or an equalize. If you're familiar with that term, that means that you're boiling the battery. You're doing electrolysis and, and generating hydrogen and oxygen uh, inside the battery to basically stir the guts of the flooded lead acid battery. Um, and that's part of why you don't want to use an FLA setting with lithium because sometimes that gets to 60, 61, 62 volts on a 48 volt system and you'll start getting um, protection errors from your BMS. The other thing that probably lead acid has over lithium as a general rule is its ability to put out cold cranking amps. Uh, if you have very, very heavy instantaneous loads, you're gonna end up using a little bit more lithium to do the same thing as lead acid, especially with the, um, some of the high current, like an automotive style battery that has a, um, instead of a solid plate, it looks like a grid pattern. And that creates more surface area to get more electrons moving, which results in more amps. And that's really that big push. Lithium, most of the time it's determined by the BMS itself. And why is that so important? The BMS really determines the quality of the product more so than the cells. So choosing the right battery management system, choosing the right product that goes inside of there is critically important. Uh, do your homework, know about tested batteries, look at what um, case studies that have been provided and look at the settings as well. Um, knowing as much as you can about the BMS is critically important. Uh, one fun thing about our metal case batteries is that's actually a serviceable item. And having worked with a couple of battery manufacturers and a couple of battery recycling companies, the BMS has been identified as the weakest link inside of the lithium product. Uh, so they may say that the cells are rated to 6,000 cycles. Well, the question is, is what is the BMS rated to? Or can I update my BMS or replace my BMS if I have an issue? And some of the pack, power packs from Muse Energy absolutely allow you to do that, especially the metal cased ones. Whereas a lot of other companies don't let you get into the inside of the unit. So ask that question when you're trying to decide and you're talking to a distributor or manufacturer of lithium. Ask them about their BMS and what some of the features that are contained inside of there and what the warranty on the BMS is over the cells. That may be an interesting conversation. I do want to make sure that I spend just a quick second letting you know that we have some fantastic products beyond our lithium ion. We also have uh, power portable cases uh, that you see on the left uh, with the Sun kit. That is a 5KW unit that can take up to 5KW of PV. Uh, it's an outdoor rated case. And really that's meant to go uh, telecom sites or construction sites. Um, arguably you could do that with a tiny home if you wanted to um, have something that was easily deployed with an inverter ready to go with plugs that just come in on the side. You drop it and land your final connections and you essentially have a system. The next product there that we see is that is the 3651. That is the flagship product for new use energy. And that allows you to have a five kilowatt hour battery along with 3.6 KW of inverter and 1700 watts of PV that can go into it on that MPPT tractor. So this is really meant to be um, some, for some serious power when you seriously need it. Uh, we've deployed these in Europe, in Ukraine, as well as with satellite communications, military applications, and the, the movie industry as well, really loves this product uh, for bringing power where they need it when they're on location. Um, if they're just back at the studios, they're also using it for convenience of lighting. So really fun. For disaster response and things like that, we build these uh, multi-axle trailers. This is a single axle trailer version, uh, but we have some very large systems that can be deployed. So if you're, uh, looking to be able to bring power where you need it, we have a deployable system there. Uh, the next photo is our foldable flexible panels, uh, part of our SunTarp series. This is the hex fold or the six panel system. Uh, this is great. It'll connect to any of the stuff that you see on the left-hand side there uh, and be able to bring 700, or sorry, 420 watts of power to any location that you would like. Uh, and you can pick it up and take it with you. It wears, weighs about the same as, um, snowboard with your bindings on there. Uh, it really is a lightweight, lightweight way of bringing power where you need it. And of course, we have a full line of batteries. Uh, we didn't get to uh, do a full breakdown or lineup of the batteries. If you are interested in that, please reach out to us. 
last but not least, we are going to be at RE Plus in 2024 in Anaheim. We'll be up on Hall E. Please come by and see us. Uh, if you want to look us up, we're under the Shenzhen uh, Grenergy Technology booth. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. It will be a full new use energy booth that we have. And uh, we look forward to showing you our portable product as well as our lithium. And we'll have our Bluetooth and uh, displays and everything else there ready to go. So if you are coming to RE Plus this year, uh, we would love to invite you to come by our booth um, at 16044. As always, if you have any questions and want to reach out, please do so. That is my email address and my phone number. You can also reach out to us at sales at newuseenergy.com. Happy to help you guys get connected with our distribution or help you understand how you can take your application and turn it into something real uh, with our support and our um, technical know-how. Uh, Riley, if we want to open it up for questions, uh, what, uh, what do we got? Absolutely. Yeah. Feel free. Anyone who has any additional questions, put them in the chat there. Uh, we did have one come in during the presentation, which was pretty simply, uh, they say, I have an inverter from 2009. Will it work? Yes. Yeah. So the, again, we need to make sure that those settings are programmable inside the inverter itself. So you've got an old inverter and you can program it for target voltages like float, absorb, bulk, uh, high battery cutout, low battery cutout. If those types of options are inside of your unit that you can program, and it's not just a little switch that switches between FLA and AGM, we really do need to make sure that you're properly programming the system. While the BMS will protect itself, you would potentially run into issues where it is protecting itself because you're driving the voltage too high or too low because that voltage window is open too far. So absolutely, you can just make sure that it is programmable. Thank you. Thank you. We had yes. one additional come in when talking about the products here in terms of uh, just mainly how do I how do I pick the right battery is kind of the, the question that came in. Yeah, so the, uh, there are so many batteries that there are out there on the market, and there are some really good products that are out there, uh, both on the residential and commercial side, what new use is being offered. I would really strongly avoid um, the Alibabas and the Amazons and those types of um, purchases because you just don't know the true quality of the product on the other end. And I have heard quite a few whoa stories on people who had ordered something from Alibaba. The batteries came in, they had a ton of questions. I couldn't answer the questions that they had because it was specific to the battery. So honestly, the, the litmus test is call the company. And if you, if there's no phone number for the company, don't do business with them. Um, but ask them the questions, talk about what product you have. Do they have familiarity with your application? If it's telecom, if it's uh, a satellite communication, is it, um, living off grid, do they have the, the background to be able to actually answer those types of questions? If the answer is no, it might be time to move on and look at a different company to help support you. The upside is, is of course, new use. We have a, uh, a huge community within our group of experience, again, from military applications to the golf cart industry to off grid and things like that. So we welcome the calls and we welcome the how to set it up, but please, it, it ain't worth the risk, uh, if I may be so forward, is to choose a battery that you have no experience on. If the old saying is, is if it seems to be too good to be true, it probably is. Any other questions, Riley? Yeah, it looks like we have a couple more coming in here. Uh, one says, I just went through my first set of lead acid batteries, but it was only two years. What can I do? Yeah. So uh, if you're just not making it through the evening anymore, which is probably, I'm guessing is happening there, um, is the batteries used to get me all the way through to morning and then the solar would come in or whatever. So this is a, probably a, a solar uh, question or might be a golf cart question, but um, if it's a renewable energy product, unfortunately, if it's not making it through the evening time, that in theory is a load test. You've run the battery, it used to work, and now you're not making it through the evening. 
Um, that is a very strong indicator. There's nothing wrong with the power electronics of the system. There's something wrong with the batteries. And the place to start first and foremost when troubleshooting uh, on that product is going back to your settings. If the settings haven't been set up correctly, that is the fastest way to murder your batteries. Are you making sure that it's not discharged too far? And are you making sure that it's getting the proper charge and holding that charge for a specific period of time, uh, which is what we would call your um, absorb time. So unfortunately, it sounds like in that case that those batteries have failed and it is probably time to switch over to lithium because you'll get that extra view inside the system and they are a little more murder proof. And so that's going to make a huge difference to your system um, in the future is choosing something that if you make a mistake, if you leave the batteries at a partial state of charge or completely discharged for a couple of weeks or a month, there is a path to recovery with lithium and that path to recovery for the AGM may be there, but you've absolutely reduced your average over life, overall life of the battery because you left it in a discharged state. There's a whole bunch of terrible things that happen to those lead plates inside. Crystals are growing and um, materials sloughing off uh, and lithium is just very resistant to that. So I would encourage you to reach out to us and um, consider going lithium this time around. I think we may have time for one or maybe two more questions, Riley. Yeah, I think we do. I think we do. Uh, we have one additional one here, which is uh, in regard to temperature. It's uh, I live where it's hot and cold, 105 degree Fahrenheit in the summer and 10 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. Uh, what can I do about batteries in those extreme temperatures? Yeah, so if you have big swings, uh, you know, uh, I live here in the Phoenix Valley area, so we get very, very hot temperatures, um, but then it doesn't take much more than a two and a half hour drive um, to, to shed about 35 to 40 degrees as you climb up towards Flagstaff. And, um, you know, we, there are products that have been deployed uh, out on the Navajo Nation, and that's at high altitude, and they get huge temperature swings. So in our experience, a, a good solid and well-charged uh, AGM or flooded lead acid battery is going to be just fine in those environments. When we get into lithium ion, they are a little bit more sensitive to temperatures below uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so if we're getting down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, there's a couple different things we can do. One, there would be a series of questions to ask yourself about putting lithium ion. Um, is the structure that it's going in, is it heated? If it is not, and it really is experiencing that 10 degrees Fahrenheit, then your best and next course of action would be choosing something like a heated battery. And there are several products to choose from. New Use offers it and other manufacturers do as well. And literally the battery pack, when they shrink wrap the, um, the material around it, they're actually shrink wrapping a heated pad also around that, um, that battery. And so that allows us to actually manage the temperature in a very positive way but you have to size for that extra load as well. So it may be that, of course, during the winter time, it's usually a little bit cloudier uh, and it's a little bit colder. So you would maybe need to add a few more panels and, and size for that if you're making that decision. If you're transitioning from flooded lead acid AGM batteries over to lithium, and you're thinking, gosh, I might need a heated pad, what should I do? Most of the time, it's pretty easy to add more infrastructure by adding a charge controller or adding a generator or other infrastructure to, to keep that system going. The other is, is that a well-insulated box goes a long ways. When you're discharging or charging a battery, uh, which typically in an off-grid or remote situation, that's happening all the time, that is generating some of its own heat. But um, there are times when uh, you wanna make sure that you're getting the right heat in there. Uh, and so a heated battery really is best practice. Riley, I feel like we got time for one more. What do we got? Yeah, we have one quick one actually uh, here, which is just, do you have distribution in Canada? We do have distribution in Canada uh, through one of our telecom sites. Please reach out to us at sales at newuseenergy.com and we will help you get connected with our uh, Canadian distribution. They're out of um, Vancouver, British Columbia area. So we'd love to uh, talk about it. If you are potentially a distributor who's interested in our products, we are absolutely um, would like to invite you to potentially come talk to uh, us about becoming a distributor. So it just depends on which direction we go uh, with that.
Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. And thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, as John said there, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to John at john.weber at newusenergy.com or sales at newusenergy.com. Both are good options. And John is happy to answer any further follow-up questions that you may have as they come up off the webinar here. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And John, I'll leave it off to you here for any final sign-offs. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we do want to encourage you if you have general questions or you're into a project and you're just trying to figure out how to do it, we have the experts here. We'd love to help you guys figure out what your next transition product is. Or if you have a new project, uh, be able to provide some guidance uh, from our years and years of experience. So love to interact with you. Love to talk to you. So feel free to either reach out to me directly or sales at newuseenergy.com. And definitely come over to our website. We've got a lot of product there that I didn't get a chance to talk about due to time constraints and would really invite you to just uh, poke around and check out some of that portable power products. They're pretty awesome. So thank you so much, you guys. Have a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend. And hopefully we'll see you at RE+.